Uh, my name is Joe McGivern. I'm chairman of the Hoyoke City Council's Finance Committee. Uh, we also have Rebecca Lisi, who's chairman of our Ordinance Committee. We have a number of special guests with us this evening. We need to first call both committees together and to convene both committees for the purpose of going into discussion, which I will explain in one moment. So if I could, first to the uh, members of the Finance Committee, uh, if you're here, please uh, say yes when I call your name. Councilor Leahy. Uh, yes, can you hear me okay? Yes, mm -hmm. Councilor Tallman. Councilor Sullivan? Yes. Yes, I'm here. Councilor Dahman is here, noted yeah. and recorded. And Councilor Bartley. Okay, no, we have four members at the moment present. Uh, Councilor Lisi, would you like to convene the ordinance committee? Yes, thank you. I'd like to call to order the regular meeting of the Committee on Ordinance. Um, the members present are myself, uh, Terry Murphy, representing Ward 2, Linda Vakin, representing uh, Ward 5, I see um, representing Ward 6 are all on the call. Okay. Please note that other members of the City Council are with us, some with their video off, other members of the City Council are all going to be you know, welcome to participate in any discussion. <laughs> the, uh, the reason we're doing a joint meeting, which is a bit unusual, was because we are very gracious to have the company of, uh, I believe, two, uh, three members from Division of Local Services. And also, we have a representative, or we had at the beginning from the last and Keith um, with us this evening. Before I, I get to each of our invited guests, we have a number of city department heads also. I'd just like to read the agenda and ask the Finance Committee meeting to take up the three items as a, as a package for the purpose of discussion. Uh, a little bit of historical perspective real quick because I and I apologize to our guest uh, that special meeting was supposed to take a half hour and uh, obviously did not take a half hour. The first item is introduced by Councilor McGee back in 2018. Our president introduced an order that the city invite at the time Matt Andre to discuss the DOR letter attached. Attached to that order is a DLS uh, communication citing some deficiencies within the city's finances and talking about the, uh, the possibility of restructuring some of our government uh, positions that deal with uh, finances. Uh, the second order was introduced more recently in January of this year by Councilor Bartley that the city auditor provide a more detailed information and additional discussion insight to the finance committee regarding the free cash calculation in which there are approximately 69 separate accounts that are considered by the department to be either other, either in other receivable, overdrawn, or deficit. The negative value of these multiple cost centers total per the auditor's calculation, $1,789,574. The auditor should supplement this summary with documents that should be assisted to, by the relevant department head whose office oversaw the accounts and that caused the deficit itself. Uh, this uh, response did come from the auditor, which we have attached. Each city councilor was uh, given a copy of, of a report. And we've been actually, this meeting has been, I think most people know, been postponed twice more, more recently because of the COVID-19 and the first time just for, uh, for, for trying to get everybody together on the same evening. Uh, the third item is various emails and publications since the 2018 publication sent to us from DOR DLS, which should also be part of the discussion, which just note that it shows that the city back in to fiscal 2019 did make an effort as, as, uh, as requested by DLS uh, to make some steps towards, towards freeing up, I'm sorry, towards rectifying those deficiencies. And at that time in 2018, we, we thought that most of that was resolved when we, as we headed into fiscal year 2020. Lo and behold, around November, December, and this is where I'm gonna, after I say this, uh, allow our guests to speak. Around November, December, we typically, I think, I think our state um, officials know, we typically don't see our free cash certification till October, sometimes at best, and hopefully by November. Well, in November, we, we had not seen anything, and that was when we first learned 
that free cash was not going to be certified this year. We actually were going to have a negative value. When we asked why, it led into the discussion that we're going to have this evening of deficiencies being taken care of with the $1.7 million. And thus, we had no free cash, the negative free cash balance to be, to be exact. Um, we have that. Um, Councilor Bartley's order is asking us, our, our auditor and, and DLS and, and representatives will be able to discuss that with us along with, is Tanya Campbell still with us? Uh, is, is... I am, yes, yep. Okay, thank you. Just wanted to make sure, representing yep. Melanson and Heath and our auditor, Tanya Dolchek, are you still with us? She's gonna be in a minute, right, Tanya? Yes, I'm, I'm, yep, I'm still with you, I was just okay. muted. Thank you. I, I, we're not, you know, whether you choose video or not, audio is most important. Um, it's just if you have video, it's easier to recognize uh, most people who are comfortable with Zoom understand if, if you need me to recognize you, you raise your you, you hit the raise hand button and, and a blue hand shows up and it shows that you're going to, uh, to be available. You'll be called for a discussion. Um, we're going to try and do this as quickly as possible, as orderly as possible. Um, we, we are here to, to learn um, as, as a city council. We want to learn as much possible about the situation of the finances of the city. And then once we we, um, and, and I think the three orders before us with the finance committee just need to be a discussion take place and possibly complied with. We then can go right into the discussion, which Council Lisi will be leading on the order, which is in her committee, which is about the creation of a uh, finance director. That has been suggested for some time now by DOR, DLS. The mayor has asked for that. It is filed under my name of uh, the courtesy of allowing that to take place. That would be at the moment by ordinance. Uh, with the issue of some possible charter changes that are going to have to be vetted out with uh, with both our law department and with the state itself. So with that in mind, um, would anybody like to lead into the discussion from DLS? Would the would our auditor like to start us off or is there anyone who would like to talk first? And I, and I apologize. Let me, and again, I apologize for this late start, but let me introduce who is here. And I'm, I'm looking at the audios, and I, I hope I'm going to get this. Joe, I'm going to um, suggest that we pass the um, mic over to um, Mr. Cronice. I'm sorry if I'm not saying your, your name correctly, but it's the Deputy Commissioner of the uh, Department of Local Services. I, I believe it's Sean Cronin. And that is, you're correct, the Senior Deputy Commissioner from the Division of Local Services. We also have Deborah Wagner. Deborah is the Field Representative of the Springfield Bureau of Accounts. And we also have Zachary, I believe Zachary Blake, yes, who is the Chief Technical Assistant to the, to the Bureau itself. And again, Tanya Campbell, who is now on us with audio, is from Lance and Heath. And our auditor is with us also, Department Heads. We have Tony, uh, we have Tony DeLude from our, our, our chief assessor. And besides our auditor, is anybody else with us this evening? Thank you. If the senior uh, deputy uh, commissioner could uh, lead us, we, we will welcome that. And welcome to all of you. Sure. My pleasure to get it going. Um, as you mentioned, I'm here with uh, Deb Wagner and Zach Blake. Uh, I'm going to give a relatively brief overview of uh, some things that Zach will get into a little bit more detail on and unfortunately I need to get on a, another call in about 10 or 15 minutes so I'm gonna do my thing but you're in great hands with Zach and Deb. Uh, Deb can definitely get into the weeds on the free cash component for you and Zach can talk more to the uh, recommendations in the financial management review. Um, so just quickly myself I do head up the Division of Local Services prior to uh, this for the last five years. Um, I was in local government for over 17 years doing municipal finance, so uh, this is what I like to do. Um, what, I, what I'm going to highlight, though, is there's one sentence in the report, again, that Zach will speak to that I think uh, succinctly summarizes the, the issue before the city, and that quote is, the mayor has limited ability to execute found, uh, sound financial management practices to coordinate activities of city departments or to implement citywide initiatives and goals effectively. If you go back to the 2015 report, 
there were other clear observations and some uh, clear assessments. Uh, just highlight a couple of those. Quote, the city's 119 year old organizational structure continues to restrict its ability to deal with stubborn financial management shortcomings. Another one, the mayor's authority is limited and exclusive to his appointees, none of whom are finance officers. And lastly, the mayor's inability to achieve some level of coordination among the city's finance officers is also evident in interdepartmental relationships. So that's five years ago, right? Now, what I'm going to speak to is really the nuts and bolts of municipal finance. I'm not, you know, I'm not talking about um, you as a council in your legis in your role as the legislative branch of government and in your very powerful role as the appropriating body. Uh, nothing we're going to talk about tonight. Um, steps on those feet, so to speak, at all. You are, this, you are the legislative branch for the city. You have the ultimate uh, power of appropriating, which is a um, pretty immense responsibility. So again, none of that stuff is what we're really talking about. It's the day-to-day -day management of finances for the city. In our opinion, again, Zach, we'll get in this gritty, te uh, gritty detail. Um, the mayor, as the CEO, should be given the tools needed to effectively manage the day-to-day -day financial operations of the city and to plan long-term, which is a um, something that the city does not uh, really do well. Uh, the executive branch should be responsible for ensuring that core functions such as accounting, cash management, collections, reconciliations, payroll, budgeting are carried out. Especially, especially today in this COVID-19 environment, um, but even absent that, government finance is so complex and challenging. Um, it, it gets more complex every year, it seems like. Um, and especially for a community like Holyoke that has uh, certain revenue constraints and you can't afford, uh, because of that, we don't think you can afford to operate under antiquated uh, organizational structures. So if you look at your current structure, you have an elected treasurer, a collector appointed by the council who must be a resident, and a city auditor appointed by the council that must be a resident. So there's a few issues we see with that. First of all, you're limiting your candidate pool by having elected positions and residency requirements. The city's best interest is to serve when you can hire and retain employees that have the strongest credentials and the most relevant professional experience. And you will only achieve that by expanding your pool of candidates. Second, having a separate collector and treasurer is inefficient. There's been a lot of cities and towns across the state that have moved to a combined collector treasurer position. And third, there's no single person acting as a CFO in what is effectively a $165 million business. I'm not sure you could go find a $165 million business that doesn't have a uh, truly empowered CFO. Um, and that's really the point I want to focus on. You really need a singular point of contact and oversight related to financial management. That would allow elected policymakers the opportunity to address the need to implement core financial management practices things like fiscal policies that you not just develop and approve, but you actually follow on an annual basis. Long range financial planning, it's critical. You know, decisions that you make today ripple through for years to come. And in many cases, once you make that decision, you can't get it back. So you need a financial planning tool uh, to help you guide your decision making. In capital planning, and I say this when I speak to uh, folks like yourself that Communities have a moral obligation for maintaining their capital infrastructure, whether it's parks, playgrounds, schools, police stations, fire stations, water source systems, whatever it is, um, you need capital planning. And then lastly, if you pull all those things together, you have a nice transparent budget documents for your residents who are paying the bills. Um, a common trait of well-run municipalities is financial planning, as I just mentioned, and those that do it well have a strong CFO. And this is why we recommend that CAFO position or Chief Administrative Finance Office. That position would bring together the siloed financial management functions of accounting, assessing, treasury collection under one centralized framework. That person would also be responsible for long-term financial planning that currently doesn't exist in Holyoke. So in addition to my role at DLS, I also served or served um, in Lawrence as the fiscal overseer and currently I'm the fiscal stability officer in Lynn Methuen. Um, and in my experience in Lawrence and Methuen, I can speak firsthand to the great value that a CFO, or a CAFO in this case, actually brings. And uh, Springfield's another great example uh, of what a strong CAFO can do for a community. 
Uh, so in both Lawrence and Methuen, there's a, there's a strong CAFO that lead the Department of Administration and Finance, and each of the division heads reports to him or her. Him or her, uh, he or she is appointed by the mayor, and all the division heads are appointed by the mayor and the CAFO together. The strong CFO structure played a huge role in their fiscal turnaround. It shows how a very simple concept, a centralized team-oriented financial management team under the executive branch can bring significant positive change to a community. In Methuen, this is, uh, I wanna say 18 months ago, two years now, give or take. Um, the, under the old structure, they had a city auditor appointed by and reporting to the city council and some issues came up that really proved to be a leading cause of their financial management issues, including a $4 million budget deficit, which brought to them the ability to deficit finance and uh, me as um, in my role as a fiscal stability officer. They changed the form, they changed the structure now, and there's a CAFO that serves as a centralized financial manager, manager and she's responsible for all aspects of municipal finance. The day-to-day -day stuff that, that most people don't know goes on um, in, the, in the different offices, which are critical. Um, they also made uh, made a move to take a county out from the council, it was the city auditor, and moved it to the CAFO responsibility. And getting toward the end here, you know, change can be hard, you know, especially in an environment like this where there's eight million things going on and um, everybody's going in, uh, you know, crazy directions. Uh, but this is something, as uh, odd as this might sound, in, in this environment, I think it's pretty timely uh, to step back and really think. Um, and again, what I'm talking about, what the team here is talking about, is the day-to-day -day core financial management items that shouldn't be politicized. We're talking about accounting, GL system maintenance, collecting taxes, managing cash flow, the fund of reconciling bank statements, paying invoices, paying employees timely and accurately, opening, closing fiscal years, all the stuff that to most people that's boring, but to municipal finance people, that's the core day-to-day -day stuff that keeps the city functioning. Um, and with a CAFO, we believe that the city would uh, be able to benefit in a few ways. One, you'll have a budget process that should commence with a multi-year revenue and expenditure forecast and ends with a, con with a comprehensive and transparent budget document so that you as counselors have an easier time understanding where the money's coming from, where's it going, along with the taxpayers. You can get a capital plan that just isn't a spreadsheet of, of desired projects from department heads, but rather a financially sound plan predicated on a prudent debt management plan over a five or six year period. Minimally, you'd get quarterly budget reports so everybody knows what's going on in the current fiscal year. You'd have collective bargaining agreements on and all other contractual obligations costed out for you before you take your votes. Again, none of this would impact your ability to appropriate. You're the legislative body and none of that would change. You'd be able to continue to debate and decide the weighty issues around resource allocation. You know, I always joke that the easiest part of budgeting is math, the hardest part is allocating the resources because it's never enough. And you're also responsible for ultimately setting the tax rate. Um, you, know, you go through the tax rate setting process, the classification process, so what you spend ends up impacting what your tax rate is. So just to conclude, and then you know, I'll turn it back uh, to the council, and if you want, Zach and uh, Deb can uh, go from there, or you can ask me a few questions, uh, however you want to handle it. Uh, but to conclude, again, we really hope that uh, the city takes these recommendations seriously and moves forward to implement them. I know none of them are easy. Um, centralized finance department led by a CAFO is proven, not just in Massachusetts, but around the country as a uh, organizational structure that can positively impact the municipality. Again, under your current structure, you have a $165 million business known as the City of Holyoke, which is financed with taxpayer monies without a financial leader. That's the opposite of what is expected and what's possible in the 2020s. To chart a financial course for the future, the buck should stop with the executive branch that is led by the strong CAFO within an organizational structure that is void of questions of responsibility and accountability. So again, with that, I'll close very, you know, 30,000 feet above sea level. Zach and Deb will get into some of the particulars, especially around the negative free cash, what happened there. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there and see if you have any questions of me. If not, you know, it's, it's, your, it's your committee. Deputy Commissioner, your words are well-spoken and we will you know, listen, keep an open mind, not just this committee, 
but also with the ordinance committee when we start talking about the possibility of some initial steps towards changing some of our structure. We have a lot to vet out in, in that area. And, and I, I think, you know, you know, I've been around for a while and, and for 30 years, I was spoiled by uh, the city auditor that I called the magic man, Brian Smith. And Brian certainly could do uh, to do wonders uh, with budgets and keep everything in line. Um, Brian is no longer with us. We have a new auditor. I call her the new sheriff in town. She's uh, gaining experience quickly and uh, we look forward to working with DLS into working with the uh, number of our department heads who I believe collectively you know, do a great job. But thank you. Are there any questions for the deputy commissioner before we go on to our next speakers? I see none. Thank you, deputy commissioner. My pleasure, thanks for having us. And Zach or Deborah, did you wanna lead in or take the ball? Yeah. Mr. Chairman, I can take the ball from here. Um, you know, thank you very much for inviting us this evening and members of the city council. It's always a pleasure to be in front of groups like you to communicate the work that we've done within the communities that we've seen. Uh, if it's okay with you, I have about a half dozen slides that I'm gonna walk through. And so I'll be sharing my screen and then Deb Wagner will be doing the same. I'm going to speak to the um, financial management update that we provided the city back in February and Deb will go into more details about what is free cash and how it's calculated and um, the specifics to Holyoke if that is okay with everyone. That's fine, that, that will be welcome. So bear with me while I get this started. Can everyone see that? Yes. I think for Zoom users, what we want is to be on the speaker view so you will get the uh, slides first. Um, it's happening here and it's happening on our access channel also. You're all set. All right, so Mr. Chairman, just uh, real quickly, um, like I said in the introduction, um, at the request of the mayor uh, last fall, we began the process of uh, performing a financial management update for the city of Holyoke. Uh, we came out and performed interviews of city staff and the mayor and um, chief of staff back in the uh, October timeframe. And then we published our report in February. So this is a, a brief walkthrough of, of the process that we go through, um, the work that we've done for the city, and then the recommendations uh, that came out as a result of uh, this most recent report. If I can get this to board, there we go. So just real briefly, the Technical Assistance Bureau is one of six units within the division. Um, you're probably most familiar with our Bureau of Accounts, which Deb Wagner is a supervisor for the Springfield region, which approves your tax rates and certifies free cash. There's also a Bureau of Local Assessment, which regulates the assessment and classification of property and methods for determining fair cash value. We have a legal bureau that provides legal and policy guidance to municipal officials, as well as our department heads. And we have a data bank and technical uh, IT department we call DARB, which provides financial and democratic, uh, demographic data to cities and towns available on our website. Uh, as well as information technology support uh, through the gateway system, if you're familiar with that, as well as other training to local officials. Um, the Technical Assistance Bureau is a little bit unique in that we provide consulting services more or less to cities and towns. Uh, our team has been doing that for approximately 30 years. I've been with the uh, Bureau myself for the last 15 and we provide guidance and assistance to communities by reviewing their overall financial management structure, providing reviews of individual department operations and assessing other issues that impact communities. We do analyze a lot of uh, financial management issues that happen related to um, forecasting, capital planning, policy development, budgets, uh, you name it. Um, we've sort of been involved at some level We've been in nearly all 351 communities over that time period. In the last decade alone, we've probably hit about 200 
in 20, 25 of those communities. Um, some of the most recent work that we've been involved in is the Community Compact Program, if you're familiar with that, with implementing financial best practices in, in cities and towns. Our general mission, just so that everybody is clear on what that is, is to develop and circulate various tools and resources uh, and manuals uh, that are available to local officials uh, so that they can better perform their jobs. Uh, we promote strategic and long-term thinking through our capital planning guidance, forecasting templates, financial policies, and budget document frameworks. We uh, encourage performance and accountability by helping communities define roles and responsibilities, which is the report that we're talking about tonight. And then we strive to connect community leaders and encourage innovation and collaboration across departments and communities in regards to shared services and efficiencies. That's a little bit about who the Technical Assistance Bureau is. Um, just taking a step back, uh, this report that we're talking about tonight was delivered in February of this year, but this is the third such report that we've offered to the city of Holyoke, uh, dating as far back as December 2007. We completed a comprehensive financial management review for the city which included 39 recommendations focused on the auditor, treasurer, collector, assessor, and overall government uh, financial management operations. We then returned in March uh, of 2015 to deliver a more focused review on the financial management structure for the city, where we offered an additional six recommendations uh, discussing opportunities to create efficiencies in centralized financial management operations across city departments. And then most recently, this review that we did was really focused on success of the, implementing those previous uh, reports and recommendations and then addressing any ongoing financial management concerns uh, and in this review, we offered four recommendations. I should tell you that all three of these reports are available on our website, mass.gov forward slash DLS. If you go there, there is a link to uh, assistance for financial management where you can go and download any and all of these reports and review them yourself. Um, collectively, they offer a lot of information um, both historical and present, uh, present on the city's uh, financial structure and uh, condition. This report itself, uh, the February report, offered a brief background on the city and then commented on some of the current challenges that are going on. Again, this is a summation really of, of two you know, other reports that we did historically, so it is not as comprehensive as those other reports are, but many of the challenges that we saw in those previous reports still existed today, so we just merely highlight them here. I'm not gonna go into the specific, specifics of the city of Holyoke, you all know this community, um, but simply put, you know, as Sean mentioned, a nearly $160 million operating budget, um, a mid-sized city of nearly 40,000, over 40,000 residents. It is a council mayor form of government. Um, and as Sean mentioned in his opening remarks, it is um, a disjointed financial management structure as we see it with the council appointing the collector assessors and assessor and auditor and the treasurer elected. Well, the mayor is really responsible for only appointing the remaining department heads. So in terms of the current challenges and in diving into that, again, there's more detail in the previous reports. We just wanted to simply highlight them here. But Holyoke, in, it can't be understated enough, faces significant revenue constraints really due to Prop 2.5 and, and the limits that are placed there and the ability to raise additional revenue. That coupled with um, it's economic development challenges that you are all very familiar with and understand well, um, make it very difficult for the city to provide for the services that it desires. You couple that with what we termed as a disjointed, antiquated financial management structure. Um, I think there are, I can't 
off the top of my head recall any other cities of this size that maintain that structure today. So it is um, unique in that way. Uh, and part of the issue with having a structure such as that is the inability that Sean talked about to really enact meaningful financial policies to develop strong long-term financial forecasts, to develop comprehensive capital plans, and to coordinate all of those into a meaningful, transparent uh, budget process. And so we talk a lot about the, the lack of financial policies in the city, uh, related to debt, reserves, uh, as well as more procedural ones associated with reconciliations, et cetera. Some progress has been made and I'll, I'll speak to that, but there is an overall need for coordination among the finance related departments. And I commend the mayor and chief of staff for beginning to hold regular financial team meetings, which is sort of the first step in making that happen. As far as this report's recommendations are concerned, and again, these are building off of the previous reports. I'm not gonna go into those in, those previous recommendations in detail. I would encourage you all to review those recommendations, but these are building off of those recommendations from those reports. The first of those is to establish a chief administrative and finance officer position that Sean mentioned. This is somebody who would be appointed by the mayor and have responsibility for supervising the financial uh, management related offices of the auditor, the treasurer, collector, and assessor, as well as department heads. This person would be responsible for developing the financial forecast for producing the capital plan that I talked about and uh, helping to develop a transparent budget to be presented uh, to City Council um, for their review uh, and appropriation. And this is a position that we found, as Sean spoke to this a little bit, paramount to helping the mayor and councilors as policymakers to move cities forward. We've seen this time and again, whether it's in Springfield, Lawrence, and Methuen, where you have a central figure that has the ability to orchestrate uh, change without the city throughout the city and improve um, you know the city's finances as well as other areas of administration. Part and parcel to developing uh, or implementing a chief administrative and finance officer position, a CAFO, which uh, we can talk about a little bit more, which would be done through a charter change. I know that you're making progress towards the idea of creating a finance director position, that is a great start and we would strongly encourage that, but we would recommend that you begin to really explore the charter changes that would be necessary to implement the CAFO. With the um, implementation of the CAFO, um, but even more specifically with the, with the rollout of the uh, strong finance director type position that you, I heard being discussed, we would recommend that the city develop a comprehensive strategic plan. Um, typically what these involve is uh, a steering committee made up of representatives appointed by the mayor, the city council, as well as residents at large that um, help uh, develop a cohesive uh, vision of what the priorities are for this community, establishing its values around um, specifically financial stability, education, public safety, economic development, and then out of those values, developing specific goals around what it is that the city of Holyoke needs to implement to achieve success in those particular areas. And the way to do that um, is uh, communities have had success with um, holding listening sessions and having broad discussions uh, among local officials as well as residents about what their desires and the direction for the community that they would like to go in. Um, I can't think of an organization that is not successful, that does not have a strategic plan. We use one at the division uh, that is, uh, we regularly update annually and it really helps uh, keep us focused on what are our long-term goals that we wanna achieve within the division and it would be something similar for the city itself. 
with uh, a strategic plan in place. Our fourth recommendation is that it be linked to the annual budget process. Very simply, what I do as a department head in regards to our strategic plan would be very similar to what your department heads would be involved in uh, in linking to their strategic plan. Every year, I am required to develop a series of goals and objectives that I want to achieve for my division as part of our process. Those are communicated in a city through the budget process when they um, solicit for departmental requests from departments to produce the omnibus budget. And those goals would be enacted as part of the budget process and measured to see if they were achieved at year end. Um, and so we would strongly encourage that the city pursue a process of uh, seeking out those goals and incorporating them as part of the narrative of the annual budget process. And then lastly, we have a recommendation to develop an annual performance management program. It's really hard to measure success without a meaningful performance management program. Uh, involved in this is ensuring that job descriptions are up to date, that there are performance goals that are set within each of the departments through the goals and objectives of the annual budget as we dis uh, discussed earlier that there be professional development opportunities available to uh, local officials to improve their skills and knowledge in and around particular areas uh, of their responsibility. And then that success be measured up through the chain of command, department heads, uh, chief of staff, to see how successful they were at implementing uh, those performance goals on an annual basis. In the appendix of the report, um, and I won't speak to every single one of them, but if you have it in front of you, there is a list of all of the recommendations that we have offered since 2007. Of those, 16 recommendations have been completed, roughly 10 are incomplete, and 13 are partially complete. Um, we got that status in our interviews with the different department heads and so we wanted to provide that uh, in the back of the report. Um, I should say overall that there has been a lot of success in the city in implementing many of the recommendations since our 2007 financial management review. That was a different period and it's uh, always, I'm always glad to see progress being made, but that doesn't mean that there are significant hurdles that lie ahead and I think an example of the challenges uh, that you're facing um, can really be shown through what Deb is gonna talk about in the certification of the free cash and the issues that revolve around that. But just before she gets to that, I just wanted to leave you with this. This is our famous event diagram that we preach to all the local officials out there that in order to be financially successful, Every community needs to develop uh, documented financial policies that are agreed to by the mayor and the city council, that there be a comprehensive capital plan in place, that the city annually uh, develop and adjust a long range forecast so you know the impact of decisions that you're making today, and that all of that feeds into a very transparent budget document with detailed narrative describing the goals, the vision, the goals, the objectives, and the challenges, as well as metrics the city is measuring its success by. And with that, I can hand it off to my colleague, Deb Wagner, who's going to speak uh, about the free cash process, if I can. Yes, um, Zach, thank you. Deb will be right with you. Um, I just want to make a, a couple quick uh, observations and lead into what I, what I think we can do but we need to finish up the finance part of this financial committee part of this discussion and lead it right into the ordinance committee where the, the points made by the senior deputy and made by, by Zach are, are well taken. And, and I, I wanna thank both of you, your comments because each of you recognize in, through your comments that our, our city is, is unique. Um, we're, we're one of the last that holds out on a, a charter with, with the Commonwealth, a charter that predates a form of government that now we often look at, you know, of Form A or Form B, strong mayor, 
weak mayor, strong council. We we have a we have a, a charter and a structure that is so unique that most people don't know how to make how to make of it. And yes, one of our we we've talked about this, not just two thousand seven. I, I was around in, in fiscal year ninety two, fiscal year ninety one, when we had a finance control board. Uh, we at that time welcomed the finance control board from the state because we knew we had to make improvements. And eventually that led into our stabilization fund. It led into a lot of better practices with the way we do, do our financial uh, oversight and, and so forth. Uh, the unique part about our, our structure is we have a, a strong mayor, but we have an equally, or I should maybe Mayor Morris and other mayors may not like me saying this, but we also have a strong city council when it comes to, and I think the senior deputy recognized our, our appropriating uh, um, responsibilities itself. The, the charter changes are the most difficult to overcome. We've attempted some of them in the past and they have failed. And the attempt before us now, as you pointed out, Zach, is to do something on an on a, on a initial step to, to try to restructure the part of government that we know we have to readdress. We also know that checks and balance is important to our to our constituents and we're acting for all the people who live within the city of Hoyoke. And the checks and balance is not easy to give up um, when, when we look at some of what our appointing authorities are, the auditor, the tax collector, the assessors, and to be able to say that, you know, we want to want to give up all that to a, a chief financial officer, which would be appointed by the mayor. I'm jumping ahead. In order for us to get into a, another healthy discussion about all this, and again, we're going to keep an open mind about these proposals because they are important, we need to find out what just happened in the last two fiscal years and what led into it. And Deb, I think you know your comments are going to help us try to analyze some of that. Um, most of us understand free cash. What we've never understood was, and again, it was November, December of you know this past calendar year, which is part of halfway through this fiscal year, which we found out, you know, these deficits were taken care of with what had been free cash without a vote by the city council. And, and you know, it's we're, we're well beyond that period, you know, that, that initial, you know, you know, two week, uh, you know, one month, two month, you know, period of when the fiscal year started, when traditionally some of these some of these deficiencies can be addressed and free cash is adjusted and then certified. We never have never voted on that $1.7 million that was used. You know, we, we were told all we have left to do is to identify some additional monies, which we're grateful the state allowed us to uh, raise through a, a what was a good year in the single family home sales market to allow us to have some type of money to get through this fiscal year. We're curious as to a lot of those deficiencies were within the police department. Some of those identified deficiencies were within the school department. And they were within grants that are that are ongoing grants that are reoccurring each year. So we, we need to understand that what you know what happened this year. We need to understand, you know, why the 1.7 million dollars was used without the city council voting on it. Um, Deb, uh, Tanya Campbell is here from the Lancet and Heath. They do our, our audit. Tanya, I know you're going to tell us that the, we're almost closing the books. I think, and which is good news because there's been years where we don't close the books as timely as we should and actually I don't want to say timely but we should be a lot more timely and we, we want to get into those positions but we need to please and I'm repeating myself Deb if you could lead us into these orders then we'll turn it over to the ordinance committee to take everything that's being said this evening so far the next step but Deb I'm sorry I'm, I'm, I'm really repeating myself could you get us you know to the next step here well, I just want to preface preface my comments with, um, you know, in this age when we're using so much te technology, there's a chance I may have a problem with my presentation, but we'll see how it goes. I, I think I dropped off our VPN and got back on, but it just may, means I may need to lo reload my presentation. So uh, let me do share my screen. Deb, with whatever you just said, you're far ahead of us, so don't worry. There you go. <laughs> it looks good with us yeah. on Zoom, and I'm waiting to watch the access channels a little bit behind. It just popped up on the local access channel. Okay, so uh, 
I just want to give a brief overview of uh, what free cash is, um, how it's generated, uh, how it can be used, why it's important, and um, what how free cash is created. So first, in terms of what free cash is as a definition, it's unrestricted available funds for appropriation by a majority vote of the legislative body. And in Hoyoke's case, that's the city council. It's certified July 1st or sometime after that based on the June 30th balance sheet, which re reflects results from the prior year. Um, we don't allow appropriation of free cash until it's been certified by the director of accounts. Free cash, once it's certified, um, expires the following June 30th. And we, um, we request or hope that people use it as a non-recurring revenue source, and so generally speaking, to not uh, fund operations of a city or town, but to use it for things that are one-time uh, costs, like a cap capital plan and th things of that nature. Uh, just a brief overview of where free cash comes from. Basically, free cash is everything that's a positive variance to your budget, whether it be revenues or expenditures. So, and when free cash certified is greater than the amount that you use, that balance becomes the basis for free cash of the next year. So that uh, creates free cash. When your actual revenues are uh, are greater than your budgeted revenues, is that creates free cash when you collect more money than you planned on. When your budgeted expenditures are greater than what you actually expend and encumber at the end of the fiscal year. so meaning that if you budgeted an amount to be appropriated in a certain department and they don't spend all of it, those funds appropriated turn back to the general fund and become part of free cash. And when your outstanding property taxes of the prior year are greater than the outstanding property taxes in the current year, that means you've collected more from other levies of other fiscal years and so that creates free cash as well. Free cash is important uh, to cities and towns because it's an available fund that can be appropriated for any legal spending purpose, including to reduce the tax rate. And I'll get into that a little bit more um, as regards the, the comments that uh, Councillor McGivern made regarding using the free cash without uh, appropriation by the council um, because it what the vote was taken involves that uh, depletion of free cash, protect, particularly to balance annual budget, endangers future spending plans if it's not regenerated. And that goes to what we were saying. We don't like to see free cash used for operations because if a city or town's budget becomes dependent on having free cash to balance their operational budget and then they don't have it, um, that can cause a structural deficit. Drawdown on reserves um, can also negatively impact uh, communities' bond rating. Uh, bond rating agencies look at your reserves and factor that in into the score that they assign a city or town. And retention of free cash or creating free cash um, allows cities and towns some financial flexibility. It allows you to have a good capital plan and it uh, instores confidence in the, the the residents of that city or town. So basically, I'm going to go briefly through what the formula to calculate free cash is. And the free cash calculation is done by the Division of Local Services. It's not done by the, by the city or town. So the beginning point is undesignated fund balance. An undesignated fund balance is the starting point for free cash because it's the, the account to which all of your revenues and expenditures are closed out at the end of the year. We subtract out accounts receivable because those represent money that you haven't yet collected. And when we certify free cash, we want to only certify an amount that's in the <coughs> door right now today, not receivable at some point in the future. We subtract out illegal deficits and we add back any re uh, receivables that may have been deferred, so any deferred revenues, and that's how we calculate free cash. And I know that's really the calculation from 60,000 feet, um, but that's the process that we use. 
And so these are some ways that we we say uh, maximize free cash. And so the things that reduce free cash are illegal deficits, uh, failure to borrow for capital project deficits at the end of the year, failure to collect real estate receivables, um, not filing for grant reimbursement paper paperwork timely and drawing down on grants timely. And then also uh, we, we deduct out from the free cash calculation any receivables and cash variances, um, reconciliation variances. So just I'll go now to the City of Hoyoke's free cash calculation. This is where we may have some problem linking to the other. There it is, okay. And I don't, I don't know how well everybody can see this, but in the City of Hoyoke's case, um, for, for the fiscal 2020 certification, the undesignated fund balance that we started with was a million seven oh three three fifty five. And then as I mentioned before, we subtract out receivables that aren't yet collected because they're not in the in the door yet at the end of the fiscal year. And then we subtract out things that are illegal deficits. And then the name is kind of nefarious for what it is. Um, sometimes there are grants that are in a deficit position um, and sometimes there are appropriation deficits. And here um, for the city of Hoyoke, and there's actually a second page, are all of the, the items that were in deficit. And so what we did for the purposes of this meeting are color code them so that you can kind of see what they are. Um, the gray area is, uh, these are refunds due, these are amounts that may be in credit balance that might be due to tax, back to the taxpayers for overpayment. Um, and the, these other ones in yellow represent grant deficits that are in a deficit position where a grant may not have been drawn down on a timely basis. Um, all of the items with an asterisk next to them are grants uh, that have been in deficit for the exact same amount for two fiscal years, indicating that the grant was probably overspent and it's a structural grant deficit. So what we did is we requested that the city of Hoyoke raise these um, and fund them because the accounts need to be made whole. Um, so that's what the yellow items are. And then going to the second page, um, you had one capital project. Can I ask you a question? Sure. It's your recognized so, Council Leahy. Yeah, thank you, Joe. Um, uh, so basically, what the reason that uh, what Joe was talking about earlier and why we were down, I think it was $1.7 million in change is because of the way the, we accounted for grants, is that correct? It's because money was spent uh, that are reimbursed by grants and the grant was either not drowned down timely by June 30th or it wasn't, um, uh, the paperwork wasn't submitted timely. I, I'm not sure what the, the re reason is. Uh, from our perspective, we see those at year end. Um, when I'm done my presentation, I can discuss a little bit about a meeting I had um, with some people from the finance department regarding um, the prior year's free cash calculation and, and um, attempting to reduce the number of deficits that you would have in a fiscal year. So, um, Again, the, the DPW fleet account, that was a capital project deficit that wasn't borrowed for by the end of the year. Um, and then all of these are agency fund accounts. There are um, some scholarship accounts that were spent into deficit. And then the de dental health trust fund, that's where you pay for your, you have your dental health, uh, your dental insurance. And that was um, spent into deficit by $196,000. Um, Off-duty police detail, those are police details that 
Um, the city hasn't um, yet collected the money from the town that owes the, or the age entity that owes the money for the detail. And then the gray items at the bottom, again, are uh, variances in reconciliations that are not identified at year end. So in April of 2019, I um, asked to have a meeting with um, members of uh, the school finance department, Tanya from Melanson and Heath, Tanya from the audit department, Bellamy Schmidt, Schmidt was there. Um, your field representative, Matt Andre, was there from the Division of Local Services, and um, Anthony Soto. And we went over the 2019 free cash certification. And I tried, and I at that time explained ways to reduce the number of deficits at your end, just so that every, everybody understands what happens when deficits exist at June 30th. It reduces the amount of free cash that will certify and you have available for appropriation. So that million seven in deficits isn't free cash that was spent without appropriation. It's just, it could have been certified as free cash if those accounts weren't in deficit at, the, at June 30th. And then the, um, in some years, what happens is the city has, uh, we've asked you to raise deficits that appear to be structural in nature. And, um, and so you, you raise them in the tax rate, but then offset that by appropriating free cash to reduce the tax rate. And in a couple of years, you did that as well. So, which is, which is good because it's not funded through taxation. Yeah, we and we recognize that over the years, you know, those of us who've been around, that 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 takes place as a change of the fiscal years. Right. But you know, this amount is very unusual, I, I believe, for for a city our size. Very unusual for you know us. And 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 I could I don't know if we have time to go through all these one by one, but you know some of this was a complete surprise to us. Some of it has been part of what we've seen, as I stated, there's three items in front of the finance committee. One that goes back from Councillor McGee for 2018. Councillor Bartley's is focused on these two pages as to exactly, you know, what, you know, we, I think we understand what you're saying, but the fact, you know, if I just took a few examples and maybe we, that might help. The, the off-duty police detail, that, that's police officers working on their own time being paid by a private entity and, and the, the police department allows the money to be funneled through, which we've, we've discussed that and debated them over the last few years to correct that. Because that, that, that's something that needs to be, a, you know, it's a police officer's right, and it's good for the city that they're doing those duties, but it's not part of the city budget. The Dental Health Trust has never been accepted by the city council. That's an agreement that was made between the city and the, uh, the Section 19 committee. They, they handle the health insurance. And it's spun into what they created, which I, I think is a good, you know, benefit for our employees, but never been accepted. And we only found recently that out the size of that deficit and what was going on. The um, the school department again is, is the part that I, I we, we we have no say in, in at the moment. We have no say over the schools at all because they're in receivership, and unfortunately, our school committee has no say over that budget whatsoever. And, and we cannot control that. And to be told that they have deficits that we have to make up for on, and, and this, don't get me wrong, the school department is part of the city budget, but you know we do separate the city side of the budget and the school department budget itself. And you got a bilingual education of $92,000, summer meals of $29,000. Focus on early literacy is a small one, but these, these are just a few examples of, what, of what's going on here. Um, the safer grant within the uh, the police department, we get the safer grant every year. You know, if there's deficiencies at the end of the year, to me, that's something that shouldn't be corrected by by making up for them with free cash. That's something that should be corrected with accounting principles. And, and, and certainly, I I hope that's that's that could hold true. The government access channel that one upsets a lot of us because the government access channel is money that comes in from a fee through our cable company, which is funneled through the city, 
currently a contract was made with Hoyopedia, and anything that's a deficit there, as part of it does go into uh, into our schools to fund a, a, a department within the schools itself. But anything that's, that's a deficit there, I'd like to know about that as to why the money is not being properly used. The National Endowment for Arts, I mean, I, we, I mean, we just could go through the whole list, and and it, it's it's mind boggling. You know, I, I get the fact that you know Bellamy Smith was our acting auditor for, a, a, and, and we were grateful that Bellamy filled in while we were trying to replace Brian Smith who left the city. Um, you know, we finally got to a position where we now have a new auditor that I think can work with department heads a lot, you know, uh, stronger, and, and certainly it needs to be done. But again. $1.7 million of what, and, and, and you all be the first to admit that the city uses free cash the wrong way. I mean, we, we went for a decade or so where we used free cash is, you know, strictly to, to try to fund our capital um, outlay needs. And, and that, that to me, I think is what DLS has always said, one-time expenditures. But over the years, we've, we've had to use free cash to, to take care of operating expenses. And that is is one of our problems, and we admit that, and one of our areas that we're trying to become stronger in. But to find out in November, December, without any vote, without any chance to have input on any of these deficiencies, that 1.7 million dollars is gone is is hard to is, it's hard to swallow. It's, it's it's hard to try to understand. You know why all of a sudden, like overnight, that happens. Is is there? Am I missing something? And, and I, I don't know if Councillor Bartley is with us. He's the maker of one of these orders. And Councillor McGee or if any other councillors want to chime in. But we, we've had we've only had this two-page list uh, since around November, December, you know, before us. And we had to make some quick decisions, as, as I stated earlier. And we're grateful, you know, to work with the LS. We're grateful to work with this. We, we have to work with the state. We want to. But... You know, the city council was caught completely off guard, you know, on some of these issues. Well, I, I just want to be clear that this is not free cash that was certified and used. It these deficits reduce what we certified for free cash. And what I stressed at the meeting that I had, because and I the reason I had the meeting I did was I think sometimes when people understand the effect of um, not applying for a reimbursement timely or uh, the, a flaw in a process, I think once they understand the effect that it has, it, it is more meaningful in terms of the processes that are implemented. So I, I was hopeful that uh, by sitting down and explaining the process to everyone um, that that the deficits for this calculation would be less than they were the prior year. I, uh, I, I, I think the I, important thing, I, I think the important thing is that there be communication among all the, the finance office in the school and the finance office in the city, in city hall about drawing down and monitoring deficits as they're getting close to year end. And these are, things that um, when we calculate your free cash, if there if the, there are items that are in deficit as of June 30th, we actually allow the city till September 30th, 90 days later, to collect on those deficits and we, and we will not reduce the free cash calculation for those June 30th deficits. So these are items that weren't, weren't uh, received until after September 30th at least. So I, I think it's a very important thing to develop processes and communications among the departments so that uh, as as year end is approaching, everybody's keeping their eye on what the, the deficits are and and uh, drawdowns are encouraged and, and that the, the treasurer, if she knows capital projects are gonna be in deficit that she return borrows to cover the deficit uh, by June 30th. Um, and, and those are the important things that need to happen to, to maximize your free cash calculation. And department heads and school superintendents, receivers need to be an important part of that. Yeah. And need to be, you know, before June 30th, you know, this needs to take place, obviously. Um, you know, the, the setup of the government here, which is the crux of what, you know, we're about to get into is, as soon as we can satisfy these questions. And I'm not too sure, I, I'm, 
just well hang on a second um you know is, is is where we need to get to so we can start talking about you know is the answer the chief financial officer um i talked about checks and balance right now hoyokers look at the mayor as the chief financial officer of the city of hoyok who oversees all these departments even the departments that the city council appoints now some people will argue that and we'll put that aside for a minute to try to keep going forward but again you, you talk about you know june you know june 30th july going into august and maybe september sometimes november december to find this out is what happened to the city council and we we have a lot of questions and and unfortunately our our new auditor you know is at the point where now i think she's starting to understand this but at the time you know when when this was happening and you're meeting with you know with Bellamy Smith who was the acting auditor you know you know was was timely to a point where it, it i think it hurt a lot of us in in terms of being informed as to where we're going don't get me wrong i said you know what Zach said what the deputy commissioner said earlier we're we're aware of of of, of the proposals we're aware of, of where DLS is coming from and we're aware of why DLS is coming you know towards this but this year was a complete surprise and then when we found out in you know in december you know that you know these deficiencies were things that many of them could have been resolved at the department head level many of them should have been resolved at the department head level and the school department has no excuse you know anthony soto is is a fantastic uh, business um, a manager in the department uh, the receiver and and we've worked with they we have been more transparent than, uh, than, than in the past years. And again, you know, the city council is a little bit closer because of receivership, our school committee doesn't, isn't acting on the line items and watching that budget the way they normally do. So there's a lot that plays, you know, that plays into it. And this leads into, you know, my, what I wanna hear about is if we do change the charter and change the structure of, you know, what most communities are done with a combined deputy tax collector treasurer with a chief financial officer, are we giving up any checks and balance that we have? But I, I don't want to get ahead of myself and I, I I apologize. Let me see if I can change this. I, I can't tell with the way the screen is, Deb, if are there any city councilors? Yes. I, I'm sorry, but I see Councillor Sullivan's hand. Councillor Sullivan and then Councillor Leahy. Please open this up for discussion. Okay. Uh thank you. Uh Deb, could you tell me now? Free cash got certified in 2018 and certified in 2017. Why are things like, if it was certified then, why wasn't like the Essex emergency demolition ninety four thousand dollars? Why wasn't this identified in any of the previous ones? Um, it may not have been on the balance sheet at that point in time. Well, where not on the balance sheet? Where would it be? <laughs> I mean, well, had the Essex you know, had the not, Essex emergency happened by then? This then, this happened. I don't know what now, Joe. Maybe you can help me on that. Five years ago. Uh, it, it's it is as pointed out. Some of this goes back to two thousand seven, but the 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 size of these deficits and, and I, I'm losing a lot of video stuff here. But the size of these deficits have been more the past two years or three years, Deb. I think where we're starting to see and. And again, if if you go back to Councilor McGee's order, um, we it looks like the D, like DLS DOR and the city came to an agreement about about three hundred thousand dollars was going to be part of fiscal year nineteen to resolve some of this. And some of us were under the impression that that took place, and now it appears that it didn't take place. All right. And well, no. So the Essex we had you raise. I believe some of it last year. I don't obviously have the certification from last year in front of me, but there, you know, when there, there's another an amount that's on the balance sheet as of June 30th this year, we're we're going to reduce the free cash calculation by it again. Um, you know, the issue may have been that you had enough free cash, and we did hit the free cash for it, and it didn't cause you to be negative. Um, we only see these deficits when the free cash paperwork is submitted by the uh, by the auditor at at the time of the free cash certification. So it takes yeah, us when, about. When was that this year? When when did you see? I would have to look, but I because Hoyoke relies on free cash to 
most of the time to set the tax rate. You didn't have any this year. We turn your free cash certification around immediately in less than a day, usually, or, or a day. So if it was whatever the date of certification it was, it, it was probably the day before that was submitted. Um, we make the city of Hoyoke's uh, certification because of the priority that you need to use usually funds from free cash to, to balance your budget or set your tax rate. We make it a priority to certify it every year. Okay. Uh, it's more expeditious. Pardon? Uh, Council Solomon, are you? Also, yes, I'm here. Yeah, I'm not even close to done yet, okay? Right. Okay, um, I see Councilor Tomlin wants to speak, Councilor Lisi. I already recognize that the next person will be Councilor Lady. And Joe, I'm sorry to interrupt. I'm Tanya Campbell also had her hand up. Okay, I, I actually have got that, Tanya. I, I, we're going to get, it would, Councilor Solomon, can we interrupt with uh, Melanson Heath for a minute? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, thank you, sorry. No, yeah, that's fine. I, I just figured I might be able to answer some of the questions and um, talk about a few things. So the Essex emergency demo that um, deficit of 94,000 was um, a reduction of the city's free cash in 2018 as well, the same exact amount. Um, and something else I just wanted to point out, um, you were discussing the fact that $1.7 million in reductions, which although is very large and um, and really shouldn't happen. Um, the city has had, in 2018, there was $2.3 million of reductions. In 2017, there was $2.1 million in reductions. So that's not an abnormally large number for the city the past few years, although it, it is um, definitely something the city should work on resolving. Part of the issue is um, your undesignated fund balance, as Deb was talking about, that's the starting point for your free cash. So. In your general fund, at the end of 2017, that number was 4.4 million. If you take that and you deduct 2.2, you still have free cash. But because the city uses almost all of its free cash every year and and doesn't generate, like Deb was saying, doesn't um, generate a lot of revenue in excess of the budget or turn back a lot of uh, unspent appropriations, you're not replenishing that free cash. So your undesignated fund balance has been reducing by about a million and a half each year. So when you do that and you don't replenish your undesignated fund balance, you know, eventually you're going to um, go into negative free cash position, which is what happened in 2019. So, you know, the $1.7 million, it's, it's a big hit, but that's one, just one small piece of your free cash or one piece of your free cash calculation. Um, kind of the bigger issue is is your undesignated fund balance a starting point for that because you have, you're not rep replenishing that and your free cash balance. So. Tanya, the last one is familiar with, with you know, our budget as, as obviously should be. And, and the points I made about some of these deficiencies in mm -hmm. Councilor Bartley's order, can, can you elaborate on that? Some of these just seem a little bit unusual to be resolved this way. Um, well, I mean, part of the issue is ever since Brian left back in 2014, the city has had like an interim auditor um, who is not familiar with governmental accounting. So just in general, um, things are behind monthly, you know, the monthly day to day um, stuff that goes on in the city auditor's office, you know, posting receipts, reconciling accounts, you know, once something gets slightly behind it just it's like a ripple effect and you know when you can't post things timely you can't review accounts timely you can't see how um, how things are how you know accounts are doing related to budget you know we've had issues in the past few years with budget um, numbers being input incorrectly into the general ledger um, when you don't have accurate financial information in the general ledger you can't properly monitor and you end up with these kind of issues where, you know, a revenue, you know, these might not be complete um, all overspent grants. It could be a revenue got misposted, but because nobody's looking at it and monitoring it with, um, you know, with good governmental background or, or knows what they're looking at, you know, you end up with these kind of situations and then they have to get corrected way after the fact. So, 
you know, for a few years now, the city hasn't been able to close their books timely. So when that's done, you can't look at an account and necessarily know it's wrong or know you need to submit for reimbursement for it. And, you know, there's no one there to remind the departments to do that in a timely fashion. So it, it's just, a, it's a snowball effect. It really is. Um, you know, the, by the time the numbers come to us to look at to compile for free cash, you know, there's still a bunch of adjustments that needed to get made. Um, then we have to give those back to the city to post and kind of start the process all over again. So by, by that point in time, it's well beyond um, the time where we could really do anything about the, the deficits. So that's, that's just what I've seen Kenya, in the past few years. Kenya, thank you. You just, in a very diplomatic way, answered all my questions. Welcome, I appreciate sir. that. Councilor Sullivan, back to you. Okay, uh, thank you. So. Now, now you've added to my problem here. So the Essex Emergency Demo Fund has now been hit two years in a row for a total of $188,000 out of free cash. Is that what I'm hearing? Yeah, it, yep. Um, and until a deficit is remedied, um, it will continue to hit your free cash every year. So the same deficit can yeah. hit your free cash Yep. multiple years if it's not funded. No, I, I get it. I, I totally get it because this is one I've been after our legal department to settle an insurance claim that's been going on for years, which is ridiculous. All right. And so now that it's been hit for 188000 everything in that or whatever that insurance claim amount is, most of that's going to go back into free cash when and if they ever settle it. Correct. Wow. All right. That's great. And the DPW fleet fund, $200,000. So that's a timing issue on getting the financing in place, the, the loans Correct. in place for it. Yep. So wh when they get those loans in place, that 200,000 comes back in also. That's correct. So just on those it two doesn't, months. It won't close to the general fund, but it will be a funding source and it won't be a hit to your free cash. A funding source in the next fiscal year for the for the capital project right all right and it looks like that's true of quite a few other things in here yeah and all the ones that were funded uh, that we asked you to raise on the recap because they appear to be structural in nature those will, should unless additional amounts unless they go into deficit additionally after the fact they shouldn't be hits to free cash in the future. No, as a matter of fact, some of these could be a plus to free cash. Right. Wow, all right. They'll just be wiped out and effectively they become a plus to free cash. Yeah, because we've already eaten them. Yes. Yeah, all right. All set, Mike? Yep. Council Leahy? Thank you. Feels like there's kind of been a filibuster tonight. Um, <laughs> I do want to say thank you uh, so very much, uh, Deborah. Sam, Tanya, Tony Delude, who um, he's been here since six o'clock and I haven't heard a peep out of him yet. So hopefully we hear him soon. Um, uh, I'm not gonna be long-winded. I'm gonna be very brief. Uh, my first question is, um, you know, City of Hoyoke is the receivership. Uh, why haven't these bills been paid? Uh, you know, I'm looking for of justice, $19,266. I'm looking for a class size reduction, 40,000. Um, you know, so right now we're in receivership. We don't have access. We can't do anything on that side. However, it's going to hurt us on our side. So why why are they paying? What are they doing? So those, again, those are just grants that need to be drawn down or uh, have the reimbursement paperwork submitted so that the grant funds can be received. That needs to be done on the, on the you know, school department side I can't speak to why they're not doing it, but again, possibly what Tanya from Melanson indicated, the fact that the books get closed so late that you aren't sure what accounts are in deficit um, contributes to the problem. But they're not, they're not money that they couldn't have. They could be draw, grants drawn down, but a process needs to be implemented where you're closing the books and reconciling 
on a monthly basis and, and looking at budget to actual spending on a timely basis. And all of this needs to be monitor, monitored on a timely basis. In one of my big cities locally, uh, the auditor has a process by which she doesn't let any bills be processed against a grant if it's in deficit and she's requested that the department draw down the grant funds. She puts a hold on the accounts. So, so there, who, who oversees the school financing then? Because we don't have control of that. It's, it's not, these grants aren't administered by, I mean, they're granted by the state but then the school has the responsibility to draw them down. Right, but we don't have access to the school. We're under receivership, so we can't, uh, we don't have the authority. Well, your school finance department, you can instruct to draw down the grants. Right. And, and Councilor Lay, if I could just jump in for a minute too, one sure. of the things that we talk about is the importance of having formal financial policies and that those policies be adopted both by the mayor, the city council, and the school committee. And one of the specific policies that we've put out, and I'm sure Tanya is, is recommends these as well, is one related to grants and the procedures involved in those grants so that there is the monitoring that goes on and that there's general agreement amongst all those parties about how they will be administered. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Councilor Tallman? Yes, thank you. Thank you, um, Deborah and Tanya and uh, Zach for explaining a, a lot of the questions that we had. Um, you know, my concern is where do we go from here basically is, uh, you know, we, we found out that uh, we, we took a big hit this year and, and I just realized that the last couple of years that we took a hit um, financially because of these, uh, these accounts. Um, and part of it, I, I understand what Tanya explained from Ellison and Heath that we had a transition in um, auditors for probably three or four years until we actually had somebody, we have somebody in there now, um, stable, that's uh, doing the job. But I, I think that made a big difference in our, our, our budgeting and our process. Um, what, what do you suggest we go from here as so that we don't have this problem year after year? You know, you stated drawing down the, um, the grants, but how else can we take care of the situation until it doesn't happen year after year. That could be to any any one of Well, I think as Zach and Yep. I think as Zach indicated, good policies and procedures around grant administrations, reconciling of accounts and monitoring budgets is is at a minimum a starting point. Right. Zach, and, and, I don't know if you have anything is, to add. The, right. Yeah, this, the, you know, the larger thing here is an issue of communication, right? And right. what we look for is that um, department heads be unified in understanding, you know, the issues that are going on within each of those offices. So take, take the um, capital uh, deficit that was there in DPW. That's an issue that occurred in the treasurer's office. And until the auditor recognizes or knows that those bondings are taking place or that financing is put in place. And so we look for regular communication, you know, what we term through a financial management team, so that they know that there are issues um, that aren't a surprise to anybody that, um, you know, the treasurer would communicate to the, the auditor that I have not put that uh, financing in place or that the auditor can remind that treasurer that that financing needs to be put in place or that there can be uh, a letter uh, outlining year-end procedures uh, like Deb suggested around, and, and Tanya talked about around grants and procedures involved in, in uh, making sure that those deficits don't arise so that they would impact from cash. Right and I, and I know you stated that earlier that um, the good fiscal management and it's 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 a part of the city that's been uh, in our charter for years how we the, the council has appointments, the mayor has appointments, and as a treasurer, you stated, is an elected position. So um, I can see how, you know, if you have a, a CAFO, that would be very beneficial to a community like ours. Um, and, and as far as taking some of these issues, these financial issues that, uh, you know, aren't, aren't being resolved and have a one person oversee everything that uh, could take care of, uh, you know, a, a year like this past year, and, and my concern is a year coming because we're getting close. We have about six weeks left to the end of the fiscal year. 
you know, what happens now? Do do we is is there a way now we could catch some of these deficits before June thirtieth? And I know um, Deborah, you stated last year we had like three months that we could take until September thirtieth to to do that. Um, how do these get paid down? Or do we have to take money from somewhere else to to take care of those deficits? No, you shouldn't have to. You should no. just okay. be able to know that. You know, we have the meeting with the city in April uh, right. with with the thought that it would give everyone a heads up on procedures that needed to be in place, you know, and it gave you from April to June to um, take a look at accounts, see if they were in deficit. Uh, but as Tanya, you know, from Lanson indicated, if, if your accounts aren't in uh, rec aren't reconciled, if, if you aren't sure or if all the revenues haven't been posted and all the expenses maybe haven't been posted you know then you're not getting a real picture until after you close and then it's too late uh to to do anything about it except to have your you know the reduction of your free cash um all of these amounts should you if if you didn't have any next year deficits of the of the nature of these items, your theoretically your free cash would increase by a million seven next year. Right, and, and these go back. And some if of you these had no other deficits, right? Some of these these uh, deficits go back a few years then. Yeah, the ones with asterisks next to them uh, go back to at least two years. Right. Right. And can you explain the one? The, I'm just trying to figure out how the Essex emergency demo how does that get added year after year at that 94,000 how, how does that work basically I'm sorry I couldn't hear the question the the Essex uh, emergency uh, demo. well how does that yeah get so out? apparently 94,000 oh yeah 90 94,325 above and beyond what I believe that's one of the items we had you raise last year um, that would need to be funded to go away or have somebody indicated a lawsuit, um, right. you know, settle the lawsuit or, but, you know, I, I'm not sure of the particulars around, um, oh, I don't, just lost my screen. I'm not sure of the particulars around that project. So, you know, that's up to the city to, determine how to remedy that deficit. Right, so th that'll be ongoing until it gets taken care of. That could be every year, it could be another 94,000. Yeah. Okay. Well, you're requiring them to raise that this year, right, Deb? Yeah, I, I believe that was another one that we had them raise this year. Okay, last year it was two other capital projects that were required to be raised. So that one, didn't you didn't require that one to be raised in um, 2018. 19. Right. Um, right. Peter, how are you doing? I'm doing well. I, th I think I, I, I got a better understanding. I appreciate it. I could, I, I'll uh, yield to somebody else. Okay. We're, I mean, I we think we're, the finance committee part is winding down. I just don't know. Councillor Bacon, are you still with us? Your blue hand is up. Yes. I think it's a leftover. Okay. Are you, are you all set for now? Yes, thanks. Okay, and Councillor Lacey, your hand is up. Um, we're gonna lead into the Ordinance Committee, but do you wanna speak on this? I do, I have a, a, just a few questions. Um, the first question, um, Deborah, thank you. Uh, this is related to the first slide in your presentation, um, talking about how free cash should not be used as a uh, regular occurrence. And is it your opinion that we are using free cash uh, incorrectly? Um, or a way that really doesn't benefit our ability to plan financially for uh, the things that we'd like to do in terms of services and capital improvements and things like that. I think we lost you for a second, Deborah. So, in the past, yeah, in the past couple of years, you know, the city's had to use free cash to get under your levy limit. And so that's in effect using it to balance the budget. 
Uh, we don't encourage that. We prefer to have you uh, use it for one-time uses only. Uh, the reality is that it's a necessity occasionally for, for cities and towns to do that. I don't, Zach, do you want to weigh in? Yeah, I would just speak to the fact that, you know, we, we generally encourage, like Deb said, that this be used for one-time purposes like capital items, that it not be used for ongoing expenditures because you know that you would have to rely on that free cash again next year in order to cover those costs. What we encourage communities to do is develop a free cash policy, uh, I'll return to that, that talks about how free cash will be generated and how it's designed to be spent. And if it's to be spent, that there be parameters in place around what it's to be spent on, maybe percentages that are supposed to be spent on, as well as percentages that are supposed to be reserved so that they um, serve as the foundation for next year's free cash. Okay, and then, um, um, yeah, so I think in general, the way the city council thinks of its budget, when we get to um, you know the budget hearings and the actual budget meeting, many councilors are working um, as hard as they can to um, reduce individual light items as, as far as they can so that um, the city council retains control over the expenditures to some extent. So we don't, we don't appropriately or, or accurately um, budget for, let's just say, you know, police overtime. We, we, we intentionally have been underfunding it because we want to have the appropriating power to say to, you know, chief, what, you know, why do you need this, um, you know, free cash for police overtime? This is just an example. It's, it's, it's an example that comes up over and over again, but, but the way that I think we are thinking about budgeting mostly um, when it comes to, you know, the actual budget decisions that we're making, um, the city council has as a policy been underfunding in individual light items so that we retain that appropriative um, control, the appropriations control, um, and we rely on free cash to um, get explanations and justifications for why different departments are spending money in the ways that they are. So would, would you recommend against that sort of practice then? So, so take the politics aside for a minute and look at this from you know, a 30,000 foot vantage point. What you would wanna do is to have a um, chief administrative finance officer presenting to the council probably no less than quarterly the financial forecast for how the city is bringing in revenues and expenditures and tracking those throughout the year. And as part of that, they would um, set the foundation, if you will, for what the revenue picture looks like for the city. From that, it's you know really the responsibility for you for the city to develop a realistic balanced budget based off of those revenue projections. And then for the CAFO to hold departments accountable for their spending and making sure that there are internal controls in place that prevent much of those deficits that you're seeing within the free cash calculation. So, you know, it's a little bit backwards how I see it today where they're purposely underfunding the budget in order to retain some level of control. You know, I look at this as they should be developing a realistic budget and then providing uh, the authority through some centralized figure, the ability to manage the community effectively given the policies that are outlined within that budget. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, and then I think it was on slide number five where you talked about the um, managing the uh, undesignated fund balance. So, um, so from what I understand, the city puts all of its, um, what it expects to have as free cash in this undesignated fund. And then DLS is going to um, certify our free cash. And so that money in the undesignated fund is really never ours until you certify it. Is that a, a, an appropriate way to think about that? That, that's, that is correct. Um, a little, one thing that's not, you're cutting out a little Not bit. Quite here. accurate is just me. your revenues and expense accounts. Your revenue and expense accounts close to the undesignated fund balance account. 
So the city doesn't put money into it like in an attempt to create free cash. Mm-hmm. That's just by the nature of the way the uh, operations of the city ended by the end of the fiscal year. All your revenues get closed in, and to the extent that they're more than you thought you were going to have, it creates free cash. All your expenditures get closed in, and to the extent that they're less than you budgeted to spend, then that creates free cash. If you collect more through tax revenue than you estimated that you would have on the tax rate, then that creates free cash. So all of those revenues and expenditures close to undesignated fund balance. And then once we do the calculation, it's certified as free cash and is available at that point for the city to use for any legal purpose. And, and one of the significant building blocks to that is is making sure that you retain a certain percentage of your free cash as unspent so that it can serve as the foundation for next year's certification so that we have those additional building blocks that Deb mentioned. Right, so right now we are, um, I think it was Tanya that mentioned this, like we, we have been producing about a $2 million plus or minus um, deficit each year and that's been drawing down that undesignated fund balance. Um, so we don't want to draw down the undesignated fund balance because that is actually what supports our ability to have free cash. Mm-hmm. Is, that's an appropriate right. way to talk about that. Okay, so then from there, um, if we do finally, um, you know, make a lot of these deficits um, and, you know, grants whole in this next fiscal year, that would automatically, from what I understand then, automatically work to support the undesignated fund balance because they would be closed out and they automatically go into that um, undesignated fund balance and provide that cushion for the free cash. Is that making sense or is that not how it happens? Kind of, so the... That's not really how it works, so yeah. Go ahead, so Tanya. Can you, can you um can you just help to create the the linear progression of how that would work? Um, so if we did make some of these deficits whole and spend all the grants that we needed to, um, we should essentially have that money. And it's from what I understand, it's not yeah. going into the general fund again. It would be going somewhere because we closed out the, these accounts and deficits. So so where where then does it land? So you didn't, these accounts are still on your balance sheet and they're probably, they probably have different fund balances at this point in time. Because they were a reduction to your free cash doesn't mean now that they're closed out. Um, Tanya, I don't know if you want to take a stab at this. Um, Yeah, I can try. So your grant funds roll from year to year. So you get revenue in and expenses are paid out of those funds. And and then at June 30th, that account either has a surplus balance or a deficit balance, depending on the timing of your revenues and your expenses. So if one of those, one of those accounts that we're looking at on um, the free cash calculation had a deficit as of 6-30-2019, the revenue could have come in in November of 2019 and made that account whole and it might not be a deficit when you're looking at it now. Um, But there are other instances where those accounts still could be in deficit and if they continue to be in deficit at 630 and no subsequent receipt is received, then it'll be a reduction to your free cash again. Um, Those funds are not part of your general fund which is where your undesignated fund balance is. Mm -hmm. Um, So those those will never close to your undesignated. It just might not be a hit to your free cash calculation if it isn't in deficit. I see. So Um, it's either closed out like as as a zeroed out. Yeah, yeah. It it never, for example, like we've already paid on the Essex House um, uh, construction. Yeah. Demolition, rather. And so um, the the only thing that can ever happen in that case is that that account is zeroed out and it doesn't create a hit for the following fiscal year. It's never going to replenish or fortify our 
um, undesignated fund, it's just going to be a, a wash so that it doesn't count against us. Against us. Exactly. Okay. Yes, that's right. true. The yep. Essex one is a little bit different because if you collect on that lawsuit, th those funds will right. close to the general fund because there's no deficit to cover in the Essex fund because you've already funded it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, so those are all my um, questions um, for this portion of, of the evening. It looks like Councilor Sullivan has one more question, though, Chair McGivern. Yes, um, I'm going to recognize Mike and just let me, to the members of the Finance Committee, I'm going to suggest that we wrap up our discussion. Um, I, I think most of us are interested. I'm going to stick, stick around, certainly, to, to lead into the next uh, order in the Ordinance Committee. But um, I would suggest that when after Mike speaks, if no one else has anything to ask or add, that we look at these three orders as for the moment complied with and see if the full city council agrees with us. And if not, we can certainly carry on further discussion in the future. Councilor Sullivan, did you, you had your hand up. Yep, thank you. Uh, either Deb or Zach, maybe you can answer this one for me. In other towns or you know throughout the Commonwealth, is there, a percentage or an average of uh, how much of your budget becomes free cash every year. And the, what, what I mean by this, is, is there a dollar amount that's too high that would indicate you're either doing a really poor job of budgeting or that you've just, you're taxing too high to have that much available? Yeah, you, th there are a number of factors that go into what is sort of the Goldilocks of free cash for a community. But, you know, generally speaking, somewhere in the range of, of 5% uh, is what we look for as a free cash balance to serve as a reserve for the community. So typically anywhere from 7 to 10% if you combine that with your stabilization fund. Uh, all right, so 5% or 7%? So, you know, obviously the higher end, these are, you know, very difficult goals to achieve for communities that are, you know, financially struggling. So, um, you know, baby steps is the way that I would look at this and to use this as a, a, a building block uh, as something that you want to achieve long term, that this isn't something to expect overnight. All right. And, and does that include the school portion of the budget as well in coming up with that? So we usually look at it as, as a portion of, well, it depends on how you want to measure it. Uh, it can be total operating budget or of the general fund budget. That's something that you would define in policy. Um, we typically look at it as uh, general operating budget. Okay, so uh, what's our budget, uh, 156 million? We should, we should be looking at, uh, Someone in the neighborhood of seven million dollars in free cash every year. If that's a policy objective of the city, that would be something that I know uh, Melanson and Heath would probably be, be supportive of. The bond rating agencies would be supportive of, and is generally good practice in municipal government. Okay, thank you. One uh, nice thing, Zach, is we've kept our stabilization fund around ten percent of the budget. For, uh, for a long time now. And I think that is one of the positives for the city itself. Absolutely. All right, Finance Committee, do you agree we complied with these orders? Do I hear a motion? A motion that it's been complied with? Complied with. Okay, items one, two, and three have been complied with. We'll report that to the full city council. If they want further reaction or further discussion, they can certainly refer it back to the committee. Um, just a thank you. We're, we're, I'm sticking around. I think most of the members are. But Zach and Deborah, thank you very much. Tanya, thank you very much. Tony, I know you're still with us, and I know you're very much interested in this next order. And Tanya Doljek is with us, too. I know her audio has not been on, but she hasn't missed any of the discussion. If anybody else is out there, we appreciate it. But to the members of the Finance Committee, on the motion that these are complied with, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Uh, Rebecca, we're just going to adjourn, and but like I said, I'm going to stick around, and uh, we certainly wish to look forward to, to finishing the discussion with the order in your committee, which happens motion. to be my order. On motion, motion to adjourn. adjourn. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposed? The Finance Committee stands adjourned. The Ordinance Committee takes over. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you all. You.
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank, thank you. you for like thank you. Entertain a motion to uh, take up the first item on the ordinance committee agenda, which is um, that a finance department be created under the leadership of a finance director, which details each to be added to our code of ordinances. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Motion has been made and seconded to take up item number one for discussion. All in favor? Aye. Aye. So moved. So do we still have Zach? Nope, we lost Zach. He didn't, they didn't get it. I think we lost our, our DLS representatives for the discussion. Let's see if we can work on that. I think Zach and the deputy commissioner's comments were led right into the order that you're about to discuss. Yeah, but I think we they were going to help us uh, navigate that conversation a bit. Um, let's see if Mike, Mike Bloomberg, are you there? Yeah, sorry, are you looking for the DLS to come back on? Just yes. um, Zach, I think. Yeah, okay. Uh, let me send him a note. Sure, thanks. Maybe Councillor McGivern can start because it's his order. Under discussion, Councillor McGivern, do you want to give some context to the the order? Thank you. Yes, thank you to uh, to the chair and to all the members of the committee and everybody who's still uh, still present. Um, I, I think the, the comments of the deputy commissioner Zach and, and even Deb Wagner helping us with the some of the more current free cash issues and and all, I think the understanding of what we're facing is is part of what the city council has and, and I believe Councilor Lisa your call has been helped, but a number of different uh, councilors have made the efforts uh, Councilor Bacon uh, going back to our prior president Councilor Jordan. Councilor Bartley and efforts to uh, to keep our, our budget within tabs and the reductions that have been made and, and debated you know every year is part of what we're the discussion. This this takes it to another level. I filed this on behalf of the mayor because um, I, I and on behalf of the you know frequent um, suggestions by DLS that this is an area that we need to we need to discuss and an area that we need to to look at. Um, I know I'm very familiar with the current structural government that we have. I, I alluded to this earlier that I am very much, you know, concerned about having not throwing out the checks and balance that we have. Um, notice that, you know, a lot of the reasons that we've uh, discussed uh, what happened with that $1.7 million not becoming free cash this year, uh, you know, dates back to an, an area where we failed to, uh, to to bring on board a new auditor to replace uh, Brian Smith, and I think that's part of the discussion that we we should be having here. But I, I you know, I, I I think the the nature of finances dictates, and the nature of the times dictates that this is something we need to talk about. And I agreed uh, to file this order on behalf of the mayor. I know Mr. Bloomberg's already told us. He told me earlier that he would be representing the mayor's office tonight. Um, the DLS spoke for themselves that they get back on. I think that's great, but that's the uh, the reason that the order is before the ordinance committee at the moment. Rebecca? Yeah. Councillor Bacon. Thank you. Do we know if the mayor has included any such position in the budget? I don't know, but we have um, Mr. B Bloomberg here. Mr. Bloomberg, do you want to speak to that question? Uh, I can say that it was up for conversation and we ultimately did not want to uh, do so without uh, approval and conversation of, of, of this committee. So in the draft that was submitted to the council this evening, uh, there is no position for a finance director, um, but we're certainly open to, to the conversation of how that can be worked into the budget. Um, and. I think one of the, the, the points that, that you uh, wisely brought up, Councillor Bacon, on the previous time was we had mentioned a way where we we think we can transition to the to the CAFO position, which requires a charter change. We mentioned that we, we believe we can transition with an in, uh, with a finance director position uh, and can do so uh, without 
net new cost to the to the city uh, by shifting positions around. Um, but that in and of itself would, would not be because it requires uh, conversation around personnel and, and individuals and, and, and departments, not something that we would want to have a, 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 an, an open public conversation around uh, restructuring of, of, of departments and positions. Um, but it, it is still something that there is a, a plan available for um, and something that, that we are, would like to move forward uh, either prior to or, or in, in the early parts of the next fiscal year. Well, um, if I still have the floor, Absolutely. I, I would just um, comment that the discussion will most certainly be public. These are public positions. I, I think they're, they're um, I, I certainly understand that sentiment. I would, I would defer to the legal department and our HR director um, as to what it would take to, uh, to have that conversation. Are you all set, Councilor Bacon? Yes, as, I mean, as long as it's understood, uh, the city council cannot add anything to the budget regardless of what we create or consider or discuss in committee in order for there to be any ability to do anything. I think it would have to be included. We ran into this problem last time. Right, and I think from, from, from what we saw last time was that the city council really didn't like things being included in the budget in advance of um, there being an ordinance creating these um, structures or positions. And so um, I think it, it really is up to the, the city council to create the infrastructure for line items to be funded. And perhaps well, Tanya is, as, as the auditor on the call, able to speak to that. But it seems like we, it's our job to create an infrastructure to then allow the, the mayor to either fund or not fund a particular infrastructure. The, the position, yes, I agree in that regard. But what I'm wanting to understand is if the money is in the budget. And what I just heard Mr. Bloomberg say is they anticipate that the money that's in the budget would cover the expense of a position were we to create it. If I heard, understood him correctly. Yes, I, I, I say yes. But, question. but is the money in the budget? It, yes, as but, considering this, but not as a as a not in in any form of surplus funds. Uh, only in a way that would require reallocation and transfers of funds. Understood. Thank you. So um, let me just say it, it it's getting late, and I find that the Zoom meeting format is exhausting for all the participants. And I I'm really interested in this issue, but I think a lot of the questions that I have um, are really for DLS in terms of um, talking through some of the supports that they can offer us in making these transitions. And especially if, I mean, it, it came across loud and clear that the um, preference is that we move to a CAFO, the, the Chief Administrative and Financial Officer position, and that any um, you know financial di director and financial department is um, just a, a step along the way. And so I think I, I would like to be able to understand like um, how they fit together, um, what kind of support DLS can offer us in um, building and structuring those positions. Um, I mean, those are the sorts of things that I think we want some some guidance and direction on. And then even, you know, I forget what community it was, um, Mr. Bloomberg, you'd have to, you'd have to help me, but um, was it Methuen that has the financial director and the finance department? Um, presently, it, and that serves as a model. It was well several different cities, and, and that's where DLS has already uh, served as support, as well as I'd reference the Collins Center um, at the at UMass Boston, which which uh, the, the state has a partnership with for municipal financial excellence. Mm -hmm. um, and and the, but the city, I think you're, I believe you're talking about is Falmouth, uh, and the okay. reason that we 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 looked at. Falmouth, even though it is not comparative in terms of size and demographics, uh, it is comparative in the sense that they still have a separate um, auditor function. They have uh, 
a financial structure that is is closer to, to the city of Holyoke's and, and how they were managed to to put together that position. So while many cities have that chief administrative financial officer, that full CAFO position, recognizing we wouldn't be able to get there for another year and a half, uh, considering the, the charter changes, we did also look to other cities that have something uh, more akin to a finance director position um, and, and, and not as much of a consolidated financial department, which would allow us to take an, an interim step forward. Yeah, so I think um, I'm just going to state, you know, what my preference would be at this point in time is to um, get an org chart that talks about how those different departments work with one another under the finance department and finance de um, director or, or in relation to uh, that department. Um, and then also, like, what are the accompanying um, ordinances and ordinance changes um, that make that happen? And then if we could have everything in a, in a draft form to be able to look at and reference and compare and contrast and then um, have input from, you know, the departments that would be working with the newly created finance director and finance department um, to see how those relationships would be um, altered or impacted. I mean, those are the things that I think we need to be able to discuss in order to, to move forward. And um, yeah, I think at this point in time, we had, we had a lengthy discussion, um, you know, first a special meeting, then a lengthy discussion with um, DLS, DOR on some of those outstanding finance issues. Um, I don't think I'm prepared to, you know, pull up, you know, to create from scratch the, the 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 things that we would need to 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 talk about and discuss and and to to really get our our hands on how this department is going to interact with other departments in the city while also helping to transition to the the capo position, um, and I, I do think I, I would I would really like to have you know the expert support that um, Zach would have provided this evening, and then if you think that the Collins Institute at UMass Boston has a representative that can really do some hand-holding for us. Um, I, I think those are the things that I would like to have as we um, flesh out what this is going to look like for the city of Holyoke. Can I? Can I... Councilor Bacon. Councilor McGivin, you're in queue. So I have a question that I'd like to refer to legal. I would like legal to weigh in on if, as we're looking at considering these changes, what charter changes would be required to actually be able to implement the changes. I would like them to look at it and give us their opinion in that regard. I, th I think that's fine. I think we, we still need to have some of those um, more, more concrete and tangible uh, things in, in, a, in a written form. Well, to let me put some specificity to it then. If we were to be creating this department it would not be possible to have an elected treasurer and it would be extremely awkward to have the city councilor appointing the auditor and the collector if there's to be a head finance person managing the finances. So that goes to the charter. So we need to understand from legal, there's no point in spending a lot of time discussing this if we can't even move forward with it unless we have a parallel action happening relative to the charter, which as we all know, is quite complicated. Um, when there's this many things involved in it, when we have to bring it to the public, which we do. You know, so I just think it would be important for legal to take a look at that. And in terms of the structure of the department, the mayor should be coming in to us with his proposal for how he would see that department. It's not up to us to sit here and figure out, um, in my opinion, what his department would look like. He's the one that wants it. He should be coming to us proactively with what it would look like. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Mr. Bloomberg, is your hand up to respond or did you take it down? It, it, I was just, uh, just wanted to, to, to clarify on the, the, the legal pieces in, in the conversations that we had with, with a Division of Local Services. Um, so to, to correct, um, it is, Councilor Reagan is correct in that we would need a charter change 
to and and the approach that we would put forward uh, would be to do a combined treasurer collector and have that position be appointed. Now the process for doing so would be to put a question on the ballot, uh, and we'd be looking to do that for for this November. It would take some time, and it wouldn't go into effect until the end of the existing term of the city treasurer. So that position could not be changed until January of 2022. That's now, the, yes, and the, and the conversation and, and, and what, what DLS has, has suggested is a good interim step is for an interim position of, of a finance director, which at least provides um, some directive and support to the existing uh, disaggregated finance departments and to give them a an essential chair that can work across the existing finance departments by ordinance or by charter, it would not be able to to oversee the the treasurer, um, but the it would be the, the the chief partner with the treasurer in terms of, of uh, financial oversight and, and partnership, and so it creates a stopgap approach. It's not an ideal long term approach, but but everyone is a, a belief that it would be a a better system than the one that we have now. I'm sorry, everyone internally believes it would be. A, a better system than, than the one we have now. Um, thank you for the clarification and to Councilor Lisi's earlier point, that would be a chart that you could readily provide to the committee. Yeah, I, I, I think that it sounds like the next step is is a request from Council to, to get further in depth as to the details of, of that type of position and transition and, and we'll certainly put that together for you. That would be my request. I echo that that request. Um, Councillor McGivern. Thank you. Very quickly, um, Councillor Bacon, I agree with her 100%. I do not see this as a way to circumvent the charter. The mayor, as Mike just expressed, is, is looking for stopgap measures after the discussion earlier this evening. I think we recognize that we have to, at the very least, talk about this. But the charter is important. And, and to do this correctly, this is a lot of charter changes down the road. The, the other point I wanted to make real quickly, though, is, is this, not just the structure, but to get some salary ranges as to what we're talking about here, because the affordability always factors into this uh, type of discussion. Thank you. I'm happy to give a brief answer on that. Yeah, you, you might as well give, give the brief answer, but of course, We'll probably want to have everything in front of us and and really you know work to, mm -hmm. to bring it all together. But if you have the answer, that would be great. Yeah, as part of the 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 stopgap solution, we don't see the position uh, because the position would expand greatly as if the position of treasurer is is eliminated or combined with that of collect, collector and put underneath it. Um, we do see a a phased approach where we have existing department heads and existing salary structures. Uh, that makes sense for a current finance director position, but we would imagine a, a higher salary if and when we were to eventually have a, a, a CAFO position, the Chief uh, Administrative Financial Officer. So the salary would also be a phased approach the same way the, the position would be a phased approach because the responsibility would expand uh, with any potential charter change. Okay. Are you all set then, uh, Councillor McGivern? You're on mute, but I think you just said yes. Um, yes, thank you. <laughs> is there anyone else that would like to um, speak this evening? Mr. DeLude, I, I know that you've been patiently on the, the call with us the whole time. Do you want to um, say anything before we wrap up here? No, I'm all set. I, you know, just... Um, you know, through the assessor and the collector, they just have to be separate. So some cities and towns have treasurer collector combined, as uh, Mr. Cronin had said before. And with the treasurer collector, they are separate from the assessors because of the checks and balances on the, you know, the mass guidelines and mass GLL, mass general laws. But that's about it, you know, going, with whatever the council wants and if there's a charter change then that's what the people would want so we'd have to go with the charter change through the people thank you i'll make a motion to table is there a second 
Uh, Juan Anderson Burgos is signaling that he's seconding. Um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. <clears throat> is that all five members of the ordinance committee then for tabling? Yep. Yes. Then the item is tabled. Um, is there a motion to adjourn then? So moved. Second. Motion has been made and seconded to adjourn. Uh, thanks everyone. I know you put in a lot of time on the um, call and uh, interface th this evening. So I, I do appreciate it. And um, I'll work to get DLS back in front of us um, along with Mr. Bloomberg and some of these requests that we just made um, shortly. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good, good night. night.